In his memoirs dedicated to World War II, Winston Churchill wrote that the only thing that made him worry about Great Britain losing the war to Germany were the German submarines. In the small town Labo in northern Germany, the last surviving Type 7 submarine stands solitary on the beach. It was this submarine type that worried Winston Churchill and posed the most severe threat to shipping in the Atlantic Ocean at the beginning of the 1940s. The Treaty of Versailles strictly forbade Germany from designing, building, or possessing submarines. All this was forbidden. Nevertheless, in order to preserve their school of underwater shipbuilding and build upon the experience gained in World War I, a shipbuilding design bureau was registered in 1922 in The Hague with German engineers as members of its staff. This firm offered many countries the possibility to purchase projects of submarines developed on the basis of the German World War I submarine UB-3. Simultaneously, they were working on the projects of so-called mobilization submarines. The larger submarine was called Type 1 while a submarine with smaller displacement of 500 tonnes evolved to become the Type 7 project. The idea was that if and when Germany entered a war, all the restrictions imposed by the Treaty of Versailles would naturally become obsolete. And submarines of this type could be built very quickly in large quantities. The further development of Type 7 submarines and their construction became possible thanks to a naval treaty signed between Germany and Great Britain in 1935. This treaty allowed Germany to have a navy of a total tonnage not greater than one-third of that of the British Navy. As for submarines, Germany was given the right to have a fleet equal to the British one. The important thing was that this submarine was very easy to construct thanks to its design, which allowed for extensive use of welding. Enormous numbers of these boats could be constructed in a relatively short period of time. Despite the design of Type 7 submarines repeating concepts from World War I, this ship had great potential for further modernization. Thus, subtypes A and B appeared, which differed from each other only in their details. The general concept of a medium submarine with a displacement of 700 tons remain unchanged. A submarine can only have well-balanced characteristics up to some specific dimensions. If it's a large submarine, it starts to have control issues when underwater. It also has problems with surfacing, submerging and excess trim differences. All this leads to a reduction in a submarine's overall maneuverability. Considering that maneuverability is no less important than combat capability, engineers added an important improvement to subtype B, the double vertical rudder. This allowed them to considerably reduce the turning circle radius, which provided certain tactical advantages. When the mass production of Type 7 submarines began, they received the designation 7C. In this case, there were two subtypes as well, namely 7C41 and C42. Specifications of submarine U995, type 7, stroke 41, 1943. Length, more than 67 meters. Beam, more than 6 meters. Mean draft, 4.7 meters. Submerged displacement, 871 tons. With this modification, the boat's hull was made longer by one frame spacing to accommodate new sonar. It's 60 centimeters. Adding only one frame allowed for a 20-ton increase in the fuel reserves as well, but it had a negative impact on speed. The submarine lost about half a knot from its submerged speed. 
It's a side tank submarine. Her aft and bow ends, side bulges and deck superstructure with the conning tower's railing were welded to the pressure hull. Maximum diameter of the pressure hull, almost 5 meters. Thickness of the pressure hull, 18.5 to 21.5 millimeters. The submarine's pressure hull is divided into six compartments. First, forward torpedo room. Second, forward battery compartment with commanding officer's cabins on the deck. Third, control room with conning tower on top of it. This is where the captain was situated during an attack. The control room was also the shelter compartment. It's surrounded by concave bulkheads that are able to withstand pressure up to 10 atmospheres. This is the pressure found at a depth of about 100 meters. Fourth, living quarters with the galley. The second group of batteries was located in its hold. Fifth, diesel compartment. Sixth, aft torpedo room. Two electric motors were also installed here. The main ballast went into five tanks, two at the ends in the outer hull, two inside the bulges, and the last one in the pressure hull, under the third compartment's deck. Three tanks could be used to store fuel. Armament, five torpedo launchers, caliber 533 millimeters. Ammunition, 14 torpedoes. The G7E electric torpedo, German submariners nicknamed it the Eel. It's noteworthy that it was developed in 1929. However, the design turned out to be so successful, the various modifications of it were manufactured until 1944. The latest versions of the torpedo were self-guided and equipped with a heating system inside the launcher, which allowed it to travel up to a distance of 7.5 kilometers at a speed of 30 knots. Artillery armament. Initially, these submarines carried the SK C-35 gun with a caliber of 88 mm. However, with the changing nature of combat, anti-aircraft armament began to appear on sevens from 1942 onwards. U-995 had the following. Flak M42U cannon, caliber 37 mm. Two Flak 38 autocannons, caliber 20 mm. Power plant. Two diesel engines with a total power of 3,200 horsepower. Two electric engines, 750 horsepower each. Two groups of accumulator batteries, 62 elements each. For this modification, the power plant was rearranged to free up 11.5 tons of displacement. This allowed engineers to increase the pressure hull's thickness. As a result, the operating depth increased to 120 meters and the maximum depth reached 300 meters. The boat was equipped with a special system that allowed her diesel engines to work underwater, a snorkel. Maximum surface speed, 17 knots. Maximum submerged speed, 7.6 knots. Operating range, surfaced 8,500 miles at 10 knots. Submerged 80 miles at 4 knots. Endurance, 40 days. Everything was sacrificed to increase the combat capability of the ship. Two people shared one bunk, and some even slept on torpedoes. All available space was taken up by provisions, and even one of the lavatories wasn't used during the first week of a combat cruise because it was stuffed full of food supplies. To complete the picture, imagine how the air those people breathed was. A mixture of diesel engine exhaust and kitchen smells, spiced with a dense aroma of cologne, which submariners generously applied to themselves as they had no means to bathe properly. Crews spent a long time in training to perfect all the maneuvers on their submarines. A large number of torpedoes were provided for training. Generally, they made tens of torpedo launches under varying conditions. That's why when a submarine sailed out on a combat patrol, it was business as usual for them. They had already carried out all the potential operations multiple times and could perform their tasks automatically. This allowed them to achieve great results.
This bunk is somewhat bigger than the rest, obviously. It's where the captain would sleep. It's unclear if he ever managed to get a good night's sleep, because even when he was resting, he was aware of all the events happening inside and outside the boat. The radio and sonar room are just opposite his cabin. When the situation required his urgent presence in the control room, the captain only needed to take a couple of steps to get there. This is the horizontal rudder control station. The rudders were driven electrically, but there was a backup hydraulic system in place. When the order to submerge was given, the operators would set the rudders to the necessary position. These valves control the main ballast. They would be opened gradually as the submarine reached a certain difference, which was controlled with the help of this device. Quite often, an unusual trick was used to speed up the submergence. All the off-duty crew members at that moment would quickly run into the bow compartment. All these actions were perfected during training, so in a battle, a well-prepared crew could bring their submarine from the surface position to a depth of 10 meters in 25 to 27 seconds. This was considered the best result in the world at that time. In the summer of 1939, German leadership formulated the main strategic objective for the German Navy, the destruction of British merchant shipping. Torpedo-armed submarines were the best candidates to do this, and the more numerous they were, the sooner this objective would be completed. On September 3, U-30 sank British liner SS Athenia. Thus began World War II at sea. The liner's torpedoing gave a certain reputation to Type 7 submarines and to the entire German underwater fleet. The Allies began to arm civilian ships with artillery to fight against submarines. In response, Germany declared unrestricted submarine warfare and started the mass production of submarines. Torpedo launches on sevens were not very different from their analogues used by the navies of other countries. However, they had a number of interesting features. For example, torpedoes were pushed out with the help of a pneumatic piston, which gave the advantage of a bubble-free torpedo launch. A torpedo could also be programmed with the necessary course, speed and depth without taking it out of the tube. This was done with the help of a mechanical system connecting to external sockets on a torpedo. The required parameters could be set both here and from the central control room. Type 7 submarines were easy to control, reliable, cheap to build and had a good balance of combat and operational qualities. Although, by their design features, these boats weren't meant for prolonged combat use, their unique characteristics, such as dive speed and maximum submergence depth, made them practically invulnerable. So, by the beginning of World War II, the German Navy had at their disposal arguably the best weapon to wage underwater war, as well as perfectly trained crews, and only one person knew how to use them, to achieve maximum results. Karl Dönitz was an experienced submarine commander. During World War I, he carried out many successful operations in the Mediterranean. From the very beginning, in 1935, he made a significant impact on the development of the German underwater fleet. He developed the tactics that would later be used by submarines, including the so-called Wolfpack tactic. Each submarine was assigned a position, and the entire group formed a line that crossed the expected route of a convoy. The width of this curtain and the distance between submarines resulted in a high probability of the discovery of a passing convoy by at least one boat. 
The data on the location and of course of a convoy could also be obtained by radio reconnaissance or aviation. All the information was gathered by an operations center on the shore, which coordinated the actions of the group and sent all nearby submarines to attack a convoy. Once a submarine discovered a convoy, she would send its position to the center and continue tracking the target, staying at a safe distance from it. In the night, she would make a dash towards the convoy surface and deliver a torpedo strike. During this, she remained invisible. The visibility is very poor at night, so you would need to search for her, need to discover her. Unlike destroyers, after an attack, she didn't need to retreat. She just dived and that's it, you couldn't see her. She then moved to another position to deliver another strike, and as there would be many submarines and they all attacked almost simultaneously, it caused the convoy's escort ships to spread out. So they would attack one submarine and another appeared. Chasing the second submarine, a third one would emerge. Like this, subs got closer and closer to the convoy, which remained virtually defenseless, and this all resulted in a very serious loss of tonnage. It meant that you could quickly and efficiently destroy convoys. On October 17, 1940, U-boat U-38 discovered the SC-7 convoy. The sub sent the convoy's coordinates to Dernitz's headquarters in Lorient. They were immediately forwarded to all the submarines patrolling that area. Throughout the following day, gathering submarines attacked three ships from the convoy. At the same time, the only escort ship, British HMS Scarborough, was reinforced with sloops, HMS Foey and HMS Leith, and corvettes HMS Bluebell and HMS Heartsease. By the end of the day, seven submarines shadowed the convoy. The night of October 18 to 19 was ideal for underwater predators, with a full moon and calm sea. Around 2100, U-46 fired four torpedoes at cargo ships Convalaria and Betus. HMS Leith rushed to find the attacking submarine. Driving the boat off, the ship sailed several miles away from the convoy. At this moment, U-101 torpedo transport Kreekirk. The vessel, loaded with iron ore, quickly sank. Closer to 2200, U-99, commanded by Otto Kretschmer, fired her first torpedo salvo. SS Empire Miniver steamed at full speed, but it didn't save her. One of Kretschmer's torpedoes struck her engine room, and the vessel lost propulsion and started to sink quickly. Escort ships rushed about among the spreading cargo ships, trying to get them together. Meanwhile, U-99 made its way to the formation center and struck the convoy ship at point-blank range without even aiming. Here's how Kretschmer described those events in his battle log. 22.30, firing from the forward launcher at a heavily loaded transport, the torpedo misses but hits another, even larger ship of about 7,000 tons. The vessel sinks bow first. 23.55, launching a torpedo at a large dry cargo ship, a hit. Her bow section is destroyed up to her bridge. 0015. I'm constantly hearing the explosions of torpedoes launched by our submarines. Destroyers rush about and fire star shells explode from time to time, but to no purpose. 0138. Firing from the forward launcher. A hit. The vessel sinks. 0155. Firing. A hit. The ship sinks in 40 seconds. Around midnight, cargo ship Assyrian, with the convoy's Commodore on board, spotted a German submarine directly in front of them, some 90 meters away. In an attempt to ram the enemy boat, the steamer engaged full speed ahead, but soon found herself far from the convoy and without any defenses. At 1.22, the vessel was torpedoed by U-101. At around 5.00 in the morning, U-123 used her artillery to finish off transport Clintonia, which has been abandoned by her crew. The gunners got so excited that they almost fired at Kretschmer's U-99 that happened to be nearby. At sunrise, the submarines left, having sunk 20 and damaged 6 of 30 cargo ships. The following night, 
Convoy HX-79 sailed through that same area. It consisted of 49 transports and 12 escort ships. Despite quite strong defences, five German submarines managed to sink 12 vessels from the caravan in the course of several hours. As a result, in three days, the Germans had routed two Allied convoys without losing a single submarine. In historical literature dedicated to the operations of German U-boats, the period from summer of 1940 through the end of spring 1942 is often called Happy Times. Then, Dönitz's Lions, as the German propaganda called submariners, were the only masters of the Atlantic. 1942 was the year of the greatest triumph for the Sevens. German submarines managed to sink more than 2 million tons of Allied shipping that year. At that time, the Kriegsmarine had 330 Type 7 U-boats, while it had entered the war with only 57 of them. German shipbuilders launched a new Seven every two days. Nevertheless, in 1943, the Allies began to gradually press Dönitz's lions at sea, bringing their defeat closer. A special anti-submarine command for the Atlantic Ocean was created under Admiral King. It dealt only with anti-submarine warfare without any distractions. That was the organizational side. There was a technical side as well. Allied fleets started to receive large numbers of anti-submarine ships. They were armed with compact sonar, anti-submarine mortars and hydroacoustic stations. All these allowed each individual ship to discover submarines, chase them down on the basis of their own data and deliver strikes quicker and with more precision, so that the German submarines simply didn't have time to evade them. Defeat in the underwater war wasn't a sudden event, but rather a gradual development. However, it all happened in quite a short period of time. All these measures bore great results. In May 1943, the Allies sank more German submarines in one day than the transports they had managed to torpedo. Between 1935 and 1945, 709 Type 7 submarines were built. 546 of them were lost in combat operations and 65 were scuttled by their own crews at the end of the war. The fate of the surviving submarines was decided by the Allies at the Potsdam Conference. From November 1945 through January 1946, near Scotland, Operation Deadlight was carried out. In its course, more than 100 German submarines were destroyed, either with explosive charges or by artillery fire from destroyers HMS Onslow and Bliska Vita. 83 of them were Type 7 U-boats. Several surviving ships entered the fleets of the victorious countries and their allies. U-995 served in the Kriegsmarine a little more than six months and was in the Northern Sea when the war ended. In May 1945, the sub surrendered to Norway and served in the Norwegian Navy for the following 15 years. With the commissioning of new submarine types, U-995 lost its value as a combat unit and the Norwegians transferred the Seven to Germany to become a museum ship. Das typ 7 program. The Type 7 program was one of the most successful German submarine building programs, especially when you think of their quantity. It's arguably one of the most numerous ship types in the world by the number of units built. I believe that even the Liberty class ships were less numerous. Type 7 submarines are quite controversial. Some say that they were the best ships of their type. Others simply call the Seven a steel coffin. Undoubtedly, these submarines were very effective. But as history proved, the development of anti-submarine warfare didn't leave them a single chance of winning. The Sevens can be compared to a sword. It was a threatening and effective weapon in skillful hands until the introduction of gunpowder.